Hui! So I've heard a lot of negative things about a new HBO Max show. Or, excuse me, pardon. Not HBO Max. Max. I don't want to be thrown in jail for using the wrong nomenclature there. I heard a lot of buzz about this new Max show called The Idol being a super stinker. The show's got like a 26% on Rotten Tomatoes and low scores across the board from pretty much anyone with eyeballs. And to me it just didn't seem like an entertainingly bad show. I watched the trailer and it just looked like a snooze fest and then I looked at the official poster and it just looks like the woman's wearing an actual orange rind for a dress. It looks CGI'd so I thought the main complaint was going to be that it's low budget or poorly put together. But apparently that's not the case. So I read a few of the reviews and I watched a few reviews as well and everything people were talking about actually did make it sound fun bad. So I decided to do what I love to do. I dove into the septic tank fucking cannonballed into the deep end in order to swim around in the sewage just to see if it was fun bad. And now Ace Reporter Charles is here on the front lines to give you the verdict after watching two episodes. It's sometimes fun bad, but mostly just bad bad. The reviews led me to believe that there was a menu here that was serving something entertaining. So I came into the restaurant and I ordered the poop, but I got served the pee. There is occasionally moments where I get what I was hoping to order, which is entertainingly bad moments and content, but nine times out of ten what I'm getting with the show, at least through the first two episodes, is just a big fucking plate of nothing. It's just boredom, empty calories. Uh, I'm gonna get into it deeply here in just a moment, but just to give you a little context for the production, it was apparently already plagued by controversy before the first episode even aired. There was a lot of behind the scenes drama and a lot of like really turbulent changes and a lot of shit going on. So a lot of people already wrote off the show and put it six feet under, put the tombstone on top of it before it even aired just because of all of this drama that was happening behind the scenes. They thought there was no way that it would actually come out and be decent. But I'm not here to really talk about all of that stuff behind the scenes because I went into this show blind not knowing any of it and it's still bad. So let's dive in. Episode 1. Now, this is where I'm immediately talking about the show just being like eating fucking styrofoam where you get nothing out of it for a long time. For the first 40 minutes, unless you're really just like, Auga! Auga! Titties! There's not a whole lot of, like, interesting things happening. Now, I mentioned boobies here because within the first five minutes, they're immediately going into just showing you tits, and it even becomes a plot point. A plot, a plot point that they kind of harp on for a good chunk of screen time, actually, where the main character Jocelyn's doing a photo shoot, and then she just, you know, derobes herself to show full bare breasts, and she just wants to let those honkers go bonkers, but there's an intimacy coordinator on set who's telling her she can't do that because it hasn't been approved by the intimacy board, the executive branch of booby coordinators. And they get mad at him for it, for trying to put the kibosh on that, because she wants to just let it all hang out. And he's saying, no, we really need approval, it's how these things go. And he's just doing his job. And he's being framed as a villain here. Like, the main character Jocelyn's getting mad at him, her staff is getting mad at him. Eventually they just try and, like, scheme on how to get him out of the equation, so they lock him in a bathroom. So I just found that pretty interesting, that its first major plot point, I suppose, is just titties. Like, actually, like, just underlined titties. How are we going to get people hooked on our show? Obviously. The tried and true method. We're going fucking caveman brain. Show them the milkers. And that, that that's the whole first part there, really. Like, that's actually the first instance of conflict or anything, really. Exposition. Which was an interesting idea. An interesting call to make. But yeah, like I said, if you're not just going into this for softcore porn reasons and like your eyes popping out of your sockets like a cartoon character when you see titties, I just really don't think there's a whole lot to get invested in within the first 40 minutes of episode one. Now to quickly blast you here with the cliff notes, uh, episode one focuses mainly on our main character Jocelyn, who is a massive pop star, but has recently fallen on hard times due to some tragic events that have happened in her life. She's had some very tragic things happen, like the loss of her mother, and they keep mentioning that she had a psychotic breakdown at one point, and two, she just recently had one of her pictures leak, and it's not a picture that you'd necessarily be hanging on your refrigerator, it's, it's not exactly a, you know, a good photo, it's a picture with cum on her face, so she, she got, she got glazed, and the picture surfaced online through a leak, and it became the number one talked about thing in the world, so people are making fun of her, and everyone's talking about, you know, Jocelyn, the mega pop star, all cummy-faced now. 
So now she's tackling that stress on top of the stress she's already experiencing through everything she's been through. And she now has a single coming out for the first time in a year. And she's not super proud of it. Everyone's encouraging her. That's an amazing song. But she herself is a little on the fence about the real quality of it. That's kind of the first half in a nutshell. They were also playing a little game of keep away with Jocelyn's phone so that way she wouldn't see the cum face picture and find out that it leaked and she's been trending online all day. And eventually she does find out. They do tell her and she takes it like a champ. She says it could be worse. And she's not wrong. It could have been worse. That could have been like a full-blown goatsy situation, right? So she takes it on the chin and then right after that decides that she wants to go to a club. So her and her friends go to a club where she meets The weekend. Tedros. So Tedros is the owner of the club that she attends and as he's you know playing music he calls her out he's like holy shit that's Jocelyn we've got to dance. So they dance and then immediately fall in love basically. Uh, they start grinding and they go to a stairwell where they're about to do a little canoodling but then one of Jocelyn's friends who's also her assistant uh, it kind of kills the mood but they still got close, they exchanged contact information like it was a goddamn car accident, and they go their separate ways. The following night, Jocelyn is talking to her best friend slash assistant, and says that she wants to bring Tedros over. And so she does. And now finally, after 45 grueling minutes, we get to the part where it gets fun bad, entertainingly stinky. We spent 45 minutes on the fucking Oregon Trail here going through all kinds of you know, unpleasantries, and now we're finally to a point where we can put a smile on our face. Before going into it, I would like to say that I'm actually surprised now, after watching the first 45 minutes, at how low the ratings are for it. Even though I found it uninteresting, I didn't find it to be like the most horrible show ever, like a lot of the reviews would have you believe. The cinematography is actually pretty good. It's shot well. Like, the, the show is well made. The biggest problem with the show is that it's uninteresting, and it's focusing on the worst parts of its narrative. It's focusing on the most unlikable parts of what the show is crafting. So it's putting all of the focus in the wrong areas, which I imagine most people are just tuning out for. So they just don't have any investment in it, and it makes it hard to actually care about what's going on. But as a show, I don't even think it's that horrible, like as bad as their views are making it seem. It's just fucking boring. That's by far its biggest sin for the first 45 minutes. But now, we get to Tedros coming into the equation. So he shows up to her house. And I'm, I can't show you the clip, but I will show you a screenshot. Tedros walks up to this house like he's the goddamn Terminator. Look at the atmosphere here. It's like a scene out of Courage the Cowardly Dog. Like, this shit is like when Spongebob and Mr. Krabs went to the cemetery to get the number one drink hat. Like, it is haunting. I don't know why he shows up like this. He's got a fucking trench coat on. He's like an assassin out of John Wick. Like, it is wild that he rolls up like this. And he goes into the house, too, with this same energy. Now, I had to take that picture with my phone because on Netflix you can't do, like, a screen cap. Or at least, I don't know how I'm too fucking stupid, I guess. But basically, the doors swing open and they're really, like, squeaky doors, like something out of a horror movie. And he's, he's like the fucking Undertaker. He just, like, slowly walks up. And he continues that, that persona... Like, this haunting presence, even once he gets to the house, it, it is so weird. So much so that the assistant, uh, Jocelyn's assistant, is like, oh, this guy's got weird vibes. So she's clearly, like, a little perturbed by it as well. And he just keeps it going. It's it's like a like five or six minute scene of him rolling up and going into the house where he's, like, creepily playing the piano while looking at Jocelyn's assistant, like, dead in the eyes, staring a hole through her fucking soul. And then he pours himself a drink. And then he's, like, checking his teeth in the mirror, licking himself, playing around with his trench coat. And then he starts sniffing her pillows, just actually taking a huge huff of the fumes from her pillows. It's so goofy. Like, beautifully goofy. Now, while he's doing all of this, Jocelyn's getting ready because she's very excited to have sex with him. And then she goes, meets him, and then wants to show Tedros her song. She wants an honest opinion and says that he's enough of an asshole to be honest with her. So, she plays the song for him, and he says he likes it, but he doesn't believe her. To which she's like, what do you mean? That doesn't make sense. What do you mean you don't believe me? He says he doesn't believe that she knows how to fuck. So we're getting very Fifty Shades of Grey here. That, that gave me the same tingles as the Fifty Shades of Grey movie, when Christian says, I don't make love, I fuck. It's so skin-crawlingly cringe. So he's like, 
I don't believe you know how to fuck. And she's like, I know how to fuck. And then he, he like, takes her robe off, and I shit you not, wraps the robe around her head, and then ties it around her neck. So it's like a manhunt fatality. So he's got the robe over, like, a paper bag that she's, that he's trying to, like, strangle her with, basically. And then he gets out a knife, and he's like, don't panic, I know you heard the knife. And then he's like, open your mouth. And then he cuts a hole for her mouth so she can breathe. It's so fucking silly. And then the episode concludes with after cutting the hole in the mouth, he says, he says, now you can sing. It's super silly. And I neglected to mention a very important point with an ice cube that happens right before Tedros puts the robe over her head like he's about to waterboard her. He takes an ice cube and he like runs it down her leg and under her like, like pussy and all that. And that ice cube <laughs> is actually a major supporting character, believe it or not. Well, not like that single ice cube, it melted, God rest its soul, rest in peace. But ice cubes in general. Because she became so inspired by that sexual experience and the ice cubes that it kind of become her vessel to tap into her more creative side. So the single she's releasing is about sex. Like it's about being a, you know, a freak, you know, getting real grimy. And when he said that he didn't believe her in the song because her vocals didn't convey that she knew how to be a freak and have sex, the Ice Cube brings out that freak side of her, I guess. In the next episode, she does a remix of that song because she said, you know what, the previous one wasn't me, this one's more me. And she plays it for her whole team to get their opinions. And the song just actually sounds like porn. Like the entire intro is just moaning and deep breathing and shit like that. It, it sounds like you just walked in on somebody in the masturbatorium going crazy. So th her staff wasn't super thrilled because it just sounds like they're listening to porn. And she gets so upset that she goes back to try and remix it. And in order to get back in the zone of being a sexual expert, she has a glass of ice cubes nearby that she, <laughs> that she keeps taking from and rubbing on her vagina and then like, squeezing at her neck in order to get back into that moaning sexual zone which i thought was <laughs> was so silly like like that made me giggle a lot so this is when the show's at its best in terms of like entertainingly fun bad shit like having to <laughs> having to kegel some ice cubes in order to do enough deep breathing on your track in order for it to sound sexually stimulating enough what, what a brilliant idea now, episode two reveals, like, the deeper plot elements here. Tedros was already kind of framed as someone who's probably going to be a bit shady in the grand scheme of things, and episode two drives it home. It turns out Tedros has a label of his own, and pretty much everyone from that club is in on it, and it seems, it's leading audience to believe, that Tedros is getting close to Jocelyn, for his own selfish gain as well as the gain of his label. So a big plot twist moment was one of Jocelyn's dancers, whom is also one of her friends, is part of Tedros's friend group. And they actively fuck and this whole thing was actually a setup. So that's episode two. Tedros gets even closer to Jocelyn and eventually floats the idea of moving into her house, which she's all on board with. Meanwhile, Jocelyn's best friend is getting a little fishy once she learns that Tedros owns this label. She's starting to connect dots that this might not exactly be the most trustworthy person. Now, that's all of the plot shit. It kind of interesting, I, I will say. Like, I think that's an interesting narrative play. Uh, however, once again, I think they just focus on the most boring parts in the episode. But this one had a lot of fun bad moments, at least sporadically placed throughout it feels like this show wants to be Fifty Shades of Grey, like, great value version, like, diet Fifty Shades of Grey. So it has these really weird moments, like, genuinely just, like, baffling moments where Tedros and Jocelyn are about to fuck. And she's like, put that bathrobe over me again, or put the robe over my face again. So he, like, blindfolds her with the bathrobe thing, and then she, <laughs> she starts like, getting ready to fuck, but then Tedros goes behind a chair and he just starts instructing her like a drill sergeant. And it, it, it goes on for, like, three or four minutes, probably more than that, probably closer to, like, five or six minutes, of him just giving her orders for things to do. So he's like, show me those titties. 
and I'll, and I'll move the titties around. And then I shit you not, he even says, imagine my cock in your throat. And, and now you're choking on it. And, and now and now you're spreading your, your little pussy. <laughs> it's so weird. So the weekend, Tedros keeps saying these things to her and she's like mimicking it in front of him like it's a, like a stage play. And it just goes on for so long. And then one of his friends that he brought over uh, is watching in the mirror and she starts doing the same thing. So Tedros is like a fucking sexual savant shaman. Like he's like fucking mind controlling women around him. Just, just by existing. So yeah, that's some good goofy fun bad shit. Uh, there's also a scene where like Tedros is instructing one of his friends how to fuck. So he has like a like a shock collar on his dick and he's like all right now you need to you, you need to look like you're ready to fuck that girl and he's like no not good enough shocks him he's like Aah! like he's like oh, okay I'll, I'll, I'll get more into it and he's like no not good enough Aah! and then says remember you're not a human you're a star and then fucking shocks his wiener again so the, the episode gets fucking crazy like it, it's going hog wild here but it's all on the stuff that i don't think most people would care about here like, the softcore porn elements of it. I guess it's not even really softcore porn. It's just, like, straight-up porn where they don't show you most of it. Actually, which is pretty much softcore. Yeah, it's just, like, all focused on, like, the sexual parts of it as opposed to the actual interesting narrative bits. Like, the whole setup plan as well as Jocelyn's friend who is now uh, getting in a position where the label's losing trust in Jocelyn, but her friend, who is the dancer, can also sing. And it's looking like they're going to replace Jocelyn with her. And she is the one that's part of Tedros's friend group, so that will benefit Tedros and all of them. Like, there are interesting elements at play, but they don't actually get the spotlight. It's all on the, make your titties bounce for me. Yeah. Good titties bouncing. Good shit. And then spanking her ass. And, like, jiggling her butt cheeks. Like, I just, that's, that's not very interesting. That's just, that's laughable. Now, there is another section of this episode that I actually thought was very interesting. It's Jocelyn's music video. She's doing a music video for the song, and it's not going well, which is why they're about to replace her with her friend. She just keeps doing the choreography over and over and over again, forcing them to restart their many, many, many hours over time, way, uh, way out of schedule, because Jocelyn needs it to be perfect. She's still overcome with grief over the loss of her mother. This is the first music video she's done without her mother being there. And she's breaking down. She's crying. And she's going over the moves so many times that her legs are getting bloody. So they have to keep, like, fixing that with makeup. And it's it's actually conveyed in a pretty interesting way. The cinematography is good. Like, it is actually good. And then eventually she gets the perfect take. Everything was, like, fantastic. Exactly what she wanted. But the camera was out of focus. So she had to do it again. And she didn't get it perfectly the second, or the 50th time around. So, like, it's actually a very interesting scene. Her staff coming in to try and lift her up, it's not working well. Her staff, you also start to wonder, do they even really care about Jocelyn? Or are they just there because it benefits them? Like, all of that's actually kind of interesting. But it is not what the show seems to want to focus on. Which I think is such a fucking misfire. And probably why so many people don't actually like the show. Because I don't think many people care to see softcore porn. Like, you just type boobies in on Google and you'll get a million fucking OnlyFans links, right? Like, you're probably not tuning into this to get porn. At least I don't think most people would be. But yeah, once again, the episode does end up being overwhelmingly boring for the most part and uninteresting. Because again, it is focusing on, like, the worst parts of what the show is offering. But, uh, yeah. Oh, another thing. The characters feel really stiff a lot in this episode, even more so than episode one. Some of these characters that come in here feel like actually phoned in performances. They didn't really care that much, which is kind of odd. I mean, especially for a show of this budget and this prestige. I mean, it's, it's a fucking HBO Max show. So I would think that they'd really make sure all of the acting is fantastic. But there's a lot of times in here where I was like, damn... That just really didn't seem like they cared at all about this whole scene. But anyway, I just thought I'd point that out. It's only two episodes. Maybe it really gets better. You know, it really finds its footing in episode three. I couldn't tell you. But I just wanted to at least give you all an update since I did watch it. And overall, I do think it was a waste of time. Like, I don't think the fun bad moments outweighed the overwhelming boredom or disinterest I had in the show. 
there's just very few fun, shitty moments that are sprinkled throughout the two episodes, and that just really wasn't worth it. So, yeah, that's really about it. See ya.